technology. It's all around us. In our homes. At our work and at our fingertips. Revolutionizing our lives in ways we never imagined. But there are side effects. Disruptions to our livelihood, our elections, and our democracy. And as technology moves forward, there's a fear some will be left behind. Losing jobs to artificial intelligence, automation, and robotics. What responsibility does big tech have to stem this tide? Does the government have the will to help? And is America prepared for the future? This is an MSNBC Recode Town Hall event. Revolution. Google and YouTube changing the world. From San Francisco, here are Recode's Kara Swisher and MSNBC's Ari Melber. Good evening from the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Tonight, MSNBC and Recode are launching a new series of discussions about how technology is changing our world. It's part of how we live, how we learn, how we vote, and how we work. There is nothing more powerful in our daily lives. This inaugural session is on jobs, and our featured guests are two titans of tech, the CEOs of Google and YouTube. And it's a big deal to have these two important tech leaders do, during what is an arguably tough time for the industry. So let's start and bring out the CEO of Google, Sundar Pichai, and YouTube CEO, Susan Wojcicki. I think we want to begin with something that has been, of course, a big topic in the news lately and is of major concern to the tech industry. America is a nation of immigrants. Today we're here in a valley of immigrants. 64% of employees in Silicon Valley are foreign-born, a striking number which makes immigration a crucial issue. Now, Google supports protections for children here through DACA. And when the travel ban was issued a year ago this week, CEO Sundar Pichai spoke out. He brought back staff from abroad and joined an employee-led protest right here at home. Absolutely. And Sudar, you and I had a lunch a long time ago before the election where we were all, we talked about the concerns you had. So let's talk, start about that. Fast forward from then, and then you all protested some of the Trump administration's issues around immigration. Can you start to talk about where we are now and how you've, what Google's role should be in doing this? Look, I mean, uh, first of all, it's great to be here. Uh, immigration, you know, for, for the tech industry is, is an important issue. Uh, you know, if you walk the halls of any major tech company, and if you talk about cutting edge technology like AI, and look at the people who are working on it, what makes US at the forefront of technology? Why other countries are envious of our position here? It's because we've always been able to get the best talent from around the world, including within the US, and get them to work together. It is essentially the recipe of our success, which is why it's an important issue. You know, we as a company, we today employ in the U.S., in over 20 states, 50,000 people. But we face a talent gap at, for very high-skilled jobs, and, and it's important we get people here. So we literally had people who were deeply affected by all of this, which is why we speak out on behalf of our employees, but more importantly, because it's actually good for the country. Talk about this, Susan, because it's an ugly, ugly rhetoric, at least politically, around this issue. How do you broach that? And your employees want you to be outspoken yeah. and tough against those anti-immigration yeah. thoughts. Well, I think, you know, we look at some of the facts in terms of what's important for our business, but then for the economy as a whole. And if you look at the statistics and you talk to economists, um, they'll give statistics like 50% uh, of Fortune 500 companies were founded by immigrants or immigrants' children. And so you see that, look, immigrants are making a big difference in the economy. We even look at Google, right? Um, Google was also founded by Sergey Brin, Larry Page. Sergey Brin came here as a young child. And so we see the significance and the importance of bringing this talent across the world um, to the to uh, well, to our business and to all these other businesses for innovation and for continuing to grow the opportunities we see. And when you look at what corporations are doing, a lot of tech is using visas and programs to bring foreign workers with special skills that a lot of people say make America better. Uh, of course, I don't have to tell you, and let's take a look, that is sometimes controversial in Washington. Right now, H-1B visas are awarded in a totally random lottery. And that's wrong. Instead, 
They should be given to the most skilled and highest paid applicants, and they should never, ever be used to replace Americans. No one can compete with American workers when they are given a fair and level playing field, which has not happened for decades. The policy question for you is, how are you using this, and do you try to make sure it's fair? We are talking about a few hundred thousand people coming in in the country, and these are typically highly skilled, skilled employees. So, for example, when we have PhDs in computer science from Oxford or Cambridge in the UK, and we need to bring them here, that's what a H-1B visa is too. And, uh, and so it's important to remember that. Uh, but I think there are, there are clearly areas where we can improve there. We just need to all get together on the table and make it better. I, I get that you're saying you, we all have to get together, but I think we can all agree the political climate has not been let's all get together. It's let's yeah. all kill each other, yeah. right? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm misreading it. No, but. look. <laughs> you're not misreading it. Okay. Uh, you know, but I think that's what I said. You know, you, know, you have a two-party system, and you have an incentive uh, to play uh, at either ends of the spectrum. I think people who have tried to govern from the center get hurt through the process. So for, if you take immigration reform, people, the gang of eight, people who try to come together and actually make progress, you know, pay the price. And so that's why people keep getting pulled apart. But I actually think, I'm confident if you pull politicians privately and you could talk, most of them want to be reasonable on this issue. And yet they're not. Because the system makes it difficult to, uh, to do so. And that's partly what we need to you know. Well, Susan, I mean, think about it. You started, this Google, people don't know this, was started in Susan's garage, actually, uh, a long time. That's when I met you, yes. I think. Um, you guys have always been outspoken, and your employees have always been outspoken. It's part of the encouragement at Google, is they say whatever they want to the, mm -hmm. to the executives at Google. And sometimes... Yes, they rather, do. They do, they're rather strongly. <laughs> yes. Um, you're getting a lot of pressure from your employees on this, right? Talk like we need to be out front, we need to be aggressive, or, or not, or do you feel like you have to speak for them? Because in a lot of ways, they're your base. Yeah. I mean, I think there, there are a few things. I mean, we want to be a company that um, you know, you, expresses our point of view when there's something that's really, really important, that we have values and those values um, can translate into policy. And um, you know, we've taken a strong stance at, on different human rights issues. Um, I think we've seen the H-1B visa as being really, really important to our company in terms of the competitiveness. Um, and we also have many, many individuals who feel really strongly about immigration. And um, you know, so we've tried to use the position that we're in to be able to make statements about this is what's important to us. But on the other hand, we also want to work with the, the government that we have, the administration that we have. We we're, uh, don't want to be taking one specific side. Um, you know, we are a company <coughs> with many different users across the board, yeah, and so we feel time, like we need to work with a, them. Isn't there, for Silicon Valley, there's one side on this, pro-immigration, correct? Or yeah. am I, again, wrong? It would be a problem if we had all this great talent and they actually wanted to go to other companies and we were here saying, oh, we're having a problem, we can't recruit those people. Um, that would be, I always see, a much bigger issue from the, a competitiveness standpoint. The leadership question is, there are things that are good for Google and may also be good for the economy. When you took a stand on the travel ban, it seemed that was partly from your own employees, regardless of the stance for Google. Uh, how do you decide when to lead like that? We talk about dreamers. You know, I got an email from within the company from someone who was, who's been at Google, who was a computer scientist from Stanford, and who talked about he found that he was a dreamer effectively when he went to get a license when he was 16. He didn't right? know. He didn't know, right? So he had studied computer science at Stanford, is one of our best performing people. So that's what the personal side of all of this is. That's who we are talking about, who we are standing up for, right? I, I want to bring in Gene Robinson to this conversation, who has an eye on Washington, is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, Washington Post journalist. And we're going to be bringing in, uh, as we mentioned, some special guests uh, from the audience. Uh, Gene, on immigration and Google's role in democracy here and these policies, um, wh what do you want to say? Well, uh, you know, it's very easy, actually, to, to write a bill that takes care of the H-1B issue, that takes care of not only the dreamers, but the 11 million undocumented, that, that, that really is comprehensive immigration reform. It was done in 2013, uh, and it passed the Senate. 
uh, quite easily, but it didn't pass the House. And, and the, so the government we have, as Susan said, is, is paralyzed on this issue. And money has a lot of influence in politics. And is there something that Silicon Valley can do to help break the logjam? I mean, we are, we are very vocal on, on these issues. Uh, we are supporting uh, many bills. You know, I've directly called Congress, Congress people on both sides of the aisle, and we'll continue to do that. It's not just us. Many other companies are doing it. Uh, but I think it's really important that we don't make it, as a, make it a tech versus, uh, you know, the rest of the country issue. Uh, I, I think it's up to us as tech companies to make the case as to why immigration is good for the country not just for tech companies, mm. right? And, and I think we have to do that better. When we come back is basically take a look at the Me Too movement, at women in tech, at some of these important conversations. Google has obviously been in the middle of them. We'll be right back. I know that we stay focused, as Lily did, and keep standing for what's right, as Lily did. We will close that pay gap, and we will make sure that our daughters have the same rights, the same chances, and the same freedoms to pursue their dreams as our sons.
Lee dies. It will be because of a lot of magnificent women, many of whom are right here in this room tonight, and some pretty phenomenal men fighting hard to make sure that they become the leaders who take us to the time when nobody ever has to say, me too, again. Thank you. It's kind of clear, you just have to do what Oprah says. Um, but <laughs> let's get into this, because there's a lot to unpack here, not just Me Too, sexual harassment, pay gap. I'd be remiss to say Google's involved in a pay lawsuit right now that women aren't paid as much. Um, there's all kinds of things going on in this area. Let's start with you, Susan. Um, one, two in 10 workers at Google are women. Now, you're one of the highest ranking women at Google. It's not just a problem at Google, it's across tech companies. You've been around a long time. What's the problem of this? I call it, everyone talks about Silicon Valley as a meritocracy. I see it as a meritocracy, mm -hmm. meaning white guys look at each other and hire each other, essentially. Mm -hmm. What's, where are we on this, and what do you think mm -hmm. needs to happen? I think the problem is, is that computer science as a whole and, and tech as a whole has a reputation of being a very geeky male industry. And so if you look, you know, not within the industry, but just at the educational pipeline, you see that we only have 20% of women graduating with computer science degrees. And um, that, that's a problem in and of itself because it means we don't have enough people graduating um, who have those degrees. And if you say, well, well, why is that? I think it has to do with this uh, perception that the computer industry is uh, a geeky, not very interesting, not social, industry and the it just couldn't be further from the truth um, oh, come on no I, I really think like it I really think I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree yes. with you okay. that strongly okay go go for it uber um, I mean like everywhere I mean, like, but, but, it's just it, there is such a hostility you know there is there is a, there's a hostility not just in pay pay it's jobs where people are and and I get this the pipeline issue. I understand that, but it's deeper than that. But, but I, didn't, I didn't say that there, are, that there aren't real issues, right. but I do think there's a stereotype that causes women to not go into it, and mm -hmm. then when women don't go into it, those problems become a lot harder, like what you're talking about at Uber. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, like there, there are real issues, and um, I think this, the, the good thing about the last year is that it exposed a lot of those issues, and hopefully that will prevent more of those issues happening in the future, and people will be much more aware of how to build a balanced workforce in technology. So how do you fix this? I mean, it's really important you can, you can change this. You know, ever since Susan started running in YouTube, the percentage of women in YouTube has increased significantly. Why do you think that is? Because she's a woman, uh, but why can't men but, do it? But, but I'm saying representation matters, right? So the way you solve this is by increasing representation of women in the tech industry. So you know, we need to make the environment more welcoming. We need to make the jobs more interesting. Women typically look for jobs with a purpose. You know, studies show that. I think it's important for them to see the why of you know, why you need technology. But it can't be just women who do this. It's no, got to be, I mean, what, what happens in the culture that happens? I know you've had more of a zero tolerance policy towards sexual harassment and other issues. How do you, what, what, how do you communicate that to the group? Is it firing people, saying why you fire them? You know, I think it's, it's getting better. Uh, you know, normally I think as, as a society, when we surface issues, people understand it. I think there's more realization of what's gone wrong. And, and I think you're going to see change moving forward. So I think uh, you're right, men need to do more. Uh, and, but I, I see change happening positively at Google, at other companies. You know, I have a daughter, and I'm excited for her to go if she chooses to in technology. I think it's going to be better the next 10 years than what's been the past 10 years. Right, I get that. But the idea, I mean, I have two sons, and I, I think you shouldn't have to have a daughter to want this, Understood. right? Absolutely. You know, I, I, that kind of thing. But when you think about this, one of the issues that comes across is the idea of standards. We have standards, we have, you know, that's the argument you get from a lot of engineers and others. And it seems to me the only time the word standards is ever mentioned is when it comes to women and people of color. The only time it never talked about the it never talks about the standards of the of the 16 stupid white men who did something. You know what I mean? It just doesn't do that. And so, where where do you imagine you have to be more outspoken as a CEO on this issue? 
You know, we have been, as Google, you know, we've been very vocal. Uh, you know, we started publishing our numbers, uh, and now everyone in the industry does that. And so we've always believed in more transparency and, and you know, surfacing the issues and working towards it. We sometimes get criticized for it, but, but I think it's important we do that. And I think, you know, I, I'm definitely seeing a shift in the valley. I'm seeing a shift in the tech industry. And, and more, more broadly uh, across the U.S. in general, so I'm optimistic. Let me go to Patty McCord, who's part of this conversation, a former chief talent officer at Netflix and also an expert on workplace culture. Patty? Hi, guys. You know, I keep thinking about all the fabulous women leaders in the Valley that have come from Google. I mean, we can all name them. Uh, and so you have this great reputation for giving opportunity for women leaders. And yet there's James Danamore, and yet there's the prevailing, you know, the, the, the cliche of the bro culture and the frat house, and the, it's, it's heaven for young white guy, Asian guy, engineers. And I think that's real. I mean, I live here too, I understand it. So, you know, when I looked at, at that particular situation, I thought, why'd you hire that guy? <laughs> I mean, you know, and then, of course, you should fire him. And so I'm bringing that up because I want to know, for each of you as leaders, what did you learn from that very public situation? And what are you going to personally do to make it different? Let's just be, James Damore was a, someone you fired pretty quickly, which, which is unusual for Silicon Valley, who is now suing you because you, apparently, he thinks you discriminate against conservative white men. Is that correct? Look, uh, On the other side, you don't pay women enough, but you also. Look, welcome to being a big company. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it's important to understand, um, you know, as a company, we provide a platform. We have users from all over the U.S. and globally. Uh, the last thing we do when we make decisions like this is look at it with a political lens or think about it in a liberal or conservative manner. Uh, even at Google, at a leadership level, we have people with all kinds of political beliefs. And, you know, and this was one particular issue. There are other issues in which we made decisions. This got a lot of attention. Uh, what he wrote in his memo uh, before he was fired was that uh, tech was male-dominated essentially because it, quote, you know, should be, that women prefer social and artistic jobs to coding because they're more into, quote, feelings and less into, quote, ideas. Um, walk us through um, how you led on that issue. Well, I, I mean, when I saw that, it was, you know, it, it brought up a lot of emotion, right? I've worked in tech for a long time, and so to hear this fundamental attack in many ways because of your biology, um, that, you, that women may be less capable because of just the fact that they are women, that was a really hard um, statement to, to process. And I, I remember discussing this with my children, and they really surprised me because the first question they asked is, is it true? Is it true that women are less likely to be successful in the tech industry because of their biology? And that really hurt. It hurt me because I have spent so much of my career trying to encourage women to come into tech, trying to say, let's overcome these stereotypes. Tech is actually a good place for women to have jobs. And uh, that just seemed to set us back so far in so many ways. Do either of you regret for one minute firing him? You know, I regret that, you know, it played out, you know, it's tough to communicate a nuanced issue in today's climate, and so it played out in a polarized way. I regret that people misunderstand that we may have made this because of a political belief one way or the other. I regret those things. But it is important for the women at Google and for all the people at Google we want to create an inclusive environment. In the context of a workplace, it was the right decision for us to make. So that's a no? Uh, I don't regret that. Yeah. Many people who are concerned about 2016 and democracy say, if you get this wrong and democracy isn't working in America, then what good is the rest of it?
problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. 2001, a space odyssey left many fearful about the risks of artificial intelligence. The future is now. Google and its parent company are leading the world in artificial intelligence research, which has the potential to solve many of life's problems, like cutting pollution, improving language translation, slashing medical bills. Other studies, though, say automation and breakthroughs could also cost tens of millions of jobs in America, millions more overseas. So now we turn to some of the most impactful work that Google may be doing that you may have never heard of. Yeah, that clip always gets me, right? Huh. I mean, that's the conception of what AI is. And you've also got big industry leaders talking about this. Elon Musk is probably the best known. Um, in an interview I did with him, he said, someday human beings are going to be like house cats uh, and computers will be running, you know, feeding us every now and then and petting us, essentially, uh, which sounds good to me. Um, but let's, talk, let's, let's take it apart, because there's been a lot of, and then the people from Google and Facebook are talking about a happy, shiny future. Let's talk about what you're doing in AI, because you do have the most AI researchers in the world, like by far. And you bought many companies and like deep minds and other things. You know, first of all, look, it's important to help people understand that they use AI today, right? You know, one of the AI is just, you know, making computers more intelligent and, and be able to do, you know, a wide variety of tasks. And we take it for granted whenever something happens and we actually adopt it. So for example, Today, Google can translate across many, many languages, and people use it billions of times a day. That's because of AI. Or if you use a product like Google Photos, if you go to Google and search for images of sunset, or if you go to Google Photos and search for people hugging, we can actually pull together people, you know, and show photos of people hugging. This is all because of AI. So you know, it's first of all important to understand you know, there are early stages of AI here, and we use it today. We don't take just a very optimistic view of AI. You know, AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on. It's more profound than, I don't know, electricity or fire. And Fire? You know, well, <laughs> fire's pretty good, uh, but go ahead. <laughs> well, it kills people too, yes, right? Yeah. We've learned to harness fire for the benefits of humanity, but we, you know, we had to overcome its uh, you know, you know, downsides too. So my point is, AI is really important, but we have to be concerned about it. I, I think it's good. That's how humanity solves things. So we worry about climate change. That's why over the past many, many years, we have gotten increasingly concerned. We all get together. There, there are things like Paris Agreement, and we are working towards solving climate change. We haven't fully figured out the answers, but we are really worried about it. That's how we make progress. So I think it's fair to be worried about AI. Uh, you know, so I, I wouldn't say we are just being optimistic about it but we want to be thoughtful about it. AI holds the potential for some of the biggest advances we are going to see. You know, whenever I see the news of a young person dying of cancer, you, you realize AI is going to play a role in solving that in the future. So I think we owe it to make progress too. So I think it's a balance. We've solicited questions, as I mentioned, from people who are also doing this work with you. I want to turn to Ture Owen, an associate product marketing manager at Google. Ture? Hi there, thank you for the time. Uh, I think a lot of us have really been impressed by the progress of AI over the last few years, but we know it can only go so far without more public support. And a lot of the public seems to be afraid and uncertain about that future. So what's Google doing to hear those concerns of the public, and then more importantly, prove that AI will help us better solve a lot of the challenges that we're facing today? Yeah, I think Trey has a good point. It's like that 2001 Space Odyssey really resonates with me. I think it, Terminator, the rest mm -hmm. of it, the idea of it, and especially when a company controls it. And, and, and we'll get to the jobs issue in a second. But how do you do that, Susan? Think about, like, you know people are scared. I mean, are you scared, for example? Well, I'm not personally scared, uh, just, just to get that out there. Um, and I think it's because... But you're because a robot, but go ahead. I am definitely not a robot. You know that. Karen and I have been friends for known each other for a long time. And, um, and I think it's because I have a better understanding of what AI is. And maybe back to the uh, question that we had here, most people just hear about AI. They see it in the movies, but n not just... Um, as you see in Hollywood, some of the you know, dramatic mm -hmm. interpretations of it, but also the positive, right? It being used for things like medical. We get a lot of requests from different medical organizations. How can we use this for better early detection? Cities, uh, urban planning, um, all I kinds got of that. Areas. Again, happy, shiny future. But here's yes. the deal, jobs.
technology has made the American worker more productive. In terms of artificial intelligence taking over American jobs, I think we're like so far away from that that uh, not, not even on my radar screen. I think it's, I think it's 50 or 100 more years. I mean, I think that is scary to a lot of people. And it's not just, you know, a lot of jobs are being displaced all over the country by automation, robotics, and, and self-driving. We'll get to that in a second. But AI, from what I understand, could, like a radiologist, you don't, you're not going to need them. You might not need lawyers, which might, some people might celebrate. Um, some people <laughs> might not. But you, you might not need accountants. You, might, you could go through very high-paying jobs. And so I think a lot of people are nervous because they sense that jobs are at risk here. No, no, look, I mean, I said it's right to be concerned, absolutely. You have to worry about it, otherwise you're not going to solve it, right? And it's important to understand tomorrow whether Google is there or not, you know, artificial intelligence is going to progress. Uh, you know, technology has uh, this nature. It's, uh, you know, it's going to evolve. I think pulling back, history shows pulling back, countries which pull back don't do well with the change. We know that. 20, 30 years ago, you educated yourself, and that carried you through for the rest of your life. That is not going to be true for the generation which is being born now. They have to learn continuously over their lives. We know that. So we have to transform how we do education. So we understand these things and we have to actually tackle them. And the way we do it is by worrying about it, right? Just this week we announced this program to train people and certify people for IT support. It's one of the fastest growing job categories in the US. It pays uh, you know, about median wage, but there is a labor shortage. It's tough to get, train people for it. So, you know, we are working to offer certification programs where Google can certify people and say you're qualified to be an IT support technician. It's a new job category which didn't exist before. So you have to train people for it. I get that argument. I've had it from Mark Andreessen, like yeah. farming to manufacturing, this and that. And I ask, what happens to the blacksmiths that we're doing the, the courses? What happens to the blacksmith, Susan? Like, I mean, what happens to the truck drivers? Who not? Can they? There's going to be anger, and especially political right. anger. Right. I, I mean, we have to recognize that there, we do live in this time where mm -hmm. there is really dramatic change. Um, from a technology standpoint and the innovations that we have, but that doesn't mean that those innovations are going to stop. Um, and there, I mean, you talk about the blacksmiths. I mean, should we not have trains? Um, trains have enabled mm -hmm. a lot of different uh, um, um, advances if you look back at our history. And so I think there is this theme that technology is going to continue, it's going to continue to move forward. You need to move forward with that technology responsibly. Um, and that means partnership between private companies and governments to be able to make sure that the blacksmiths, as you call them, or the any any group whose, whose job winds up changing has the right support systems to be able to retrain, to be able to um, f find what the, what, what's, what, are, what are the next set of jobs. And we have that our job um, economy keeps changing. So we actually, and, and Sundar will talk, I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but we actually um, recently committed, Google committed a billion dollars mm -hmm. um, yeah, for job retraining of American workers over the next five years. And yeah. that's an example of something that we think is really important. All of us are obviously, you know, very upset that somebody could have influenced the election.
Welcome back to our Revolution Special. Our next uh, expert is someone that I have a very personal connection with, although she doesn't know it. Um, for years I've struggled uh, with the IKEA instructions. <laughs> I find them very difficult. Uh, and the creation of TaskRabbit changed uh, my furniture life. Um, our, the CEO. You know, men are so bad with tools, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, yeah, it's in our... Stacey Brown uh, Philpot is the CEO of TaskRabbit, which, if you don't know, does on-demand labor in the so-called gig economy. Uh, Stacey, uh, what is on your mind right now? Well, we're, we're part of what's this broader sharing economy, and people talk about it sometimes in a flippant way, but it's here to stay. Millions and millions of Americans are choosing this new way of work, and it's not just because it's the flexibility, it's also the income. It's a meaningful income that people are earning. And what we need to add to that is portable benefits. What we need to add to that is training and retraining. We've been talking about retraining. So what keeps me up at night is that we're in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution and the automation will take the jobs away faster than the new jobs are created. And I saw this happen growing up in Detroit where the auto industry declined and cities, my city was decimated. It's coming back, but it's taken three decades for that to happen. So what can we in Silicon Valley do in technology to make the retraining happen as fast as the automation and is also taking those jobs And also add, away. I think, Stacy, healthcare to it. Uh, other things that have underpinned employment for so long are gone for a lot of people. It's a very important point. You know, post, uh, you know, Stacy mentioned this is the fourth industrial revolution. You know, after the last industrial revolution, we developed many programs in the country, right? And you know, including social security and. Uh, Medicare, et cetera, right? And so I think it's important uh, to think about as we go through this fourth industrial revolution, what is the new societal structures by which we support people? I think, I think that's absolutely important to think about. Well, Susan, I, I wonder if part of the, the overlap between something like TaskRabbit and YouTube is people are getting income and revenue streams they never would have otherwise gotten, mm -hmm. which is great. Right. But if it becomes their primary job, there's no benefits there. What, what is the answer for them? I think, first of all, yes, definitely, um, as technology changes the landscape, it is creating jobs and it is creating um, opportunities that we just didn't have in the past. Um, but if we look at that healthcare and you say, what's the opportunity or what's the risks, right, of being a contractor or working independently, then I think it is really, really important that people have access to healthcare and that they're able to have a free market to be able to purchase that. Um, and if if the economy is shifting that way, that we have a lot more independent contractors, then yes, we need to have those support services that are available to them. You know, are we offering the right training in school? Is the training the right amount of time? Are we covering the right subjects? All of those are issues that are important for us to address, and we're leading and discussing some mm -hmm. of the conversation, but at the end, it has to be a partnership between government and private um, industry to be able to solve these challenges. I mean, we, have a, we have this program at Goodwill, uh, just $10 million over three years. Goodwill has 156 locations. They're close to 80% of the population in the U.S. And they're committing to train 1.2 million people in digital skills and find jobs. So we need more programs like that. You know, I think government has to play a role, and that's how you, you make these transitions. Well, when you talk about being on that job search, I want to go directly to someone in, the, in that uh, capacity. This is a question here from our audience. Uh, Matthew Ramirez studied applied economics and is seeking employment. Matthew? Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I guess a question that uh, a lot of us in the public are wondering is what can someone with a non-technical background do to become a more desirable candidate in technology sectors uh, such as Google or any of the other Silicon Valley companies? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I think when participating in the technology sector is not about learning code or computer science. That's just one part of it. I think retraining, equipping yourself with digital skills uh, is the way you make these transitions, right? And you know, there are, there are many categories of job. I gave IT support as an example. The actual qualification to, to learn and be qualified to do IT support, you know, it's possible for many more people than they realize. And it's one of the fastest growing jobs in the country. So it's, 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 it, healthcare is a great example. There are many healthcare jobs where there is labor shortage. So I think it's understanding that and retraining people to be able to do those things is what we need so, to do. 
So actually, I don't have a technical degree. Yeah. Um, and I studied, You've done pretty well. I studied history and literature, and I actually really appreciate that. I think it's given me a good perspective on some of these changes, for example, that we're, that we're going through now. And I actually have applied economics degree as a master's. Um, and I thought it was very useful, um, especially when we live in an economy where um, using data and understanding um, data analysis is, is important, but what I found is most important is really the willingness to be able to con be continually learning. Up next, 2016 was the year foreign adversaries used the internet to hijack politics, so we turn to Google's civic responsibilities in a rapidly changing democracy. We continue with the CEOs of Google and YouTube. All right, so cyberbullying, Russians hacking elections, ISIS propaganda, Logan Paul. It seems like this year has just been one horrible accident after another for, uh, not accidents even, for, for Google and other tech platforms and the responsibilities that they have to tackle these problems. Um, 
are we relying too much on computers to tackle these problems? Because I think that's, that's what a lot of people feel. I know, Susan, you just announced that you were going to hire more people to deal with content issues. And I know you've talked a lot about Logan Paul, but it's the same idea of have you all relied too much on computers who you don't have to pay and not enough on people? Um, start with the 10,000 people, because I think you need a million people to monitor YouTube at this point. So we announced uh, that we are going to hire 10,000 people to help us manage and enforce the policies that we have across content and across Google and YouTube. And just, just to back up for a minute, we have always had policies we call, on YouTube, we call them community guidelines. And um, we have always enforced those community guidelines. Um, with people, what people do is they flag the content, then when we review it with people, um, and then we take it down. Um, what's really interesting, and I think has been really important development this year, as there's been a lot more concerns, has been using machine learning to actually identify and find those videos, and then have people review them afterwards to take them down, and we've actually become much, much more effective now that we have actually started deploying machine learning in addition to the people. So we are ramping up both the machine technology as well as the people, 10,000 people who will be helping us with controversial content on, on across our platforms. But I think we have a huge responsibility here. You know, our mission is to organize information and people trust us to do it correctly. And so every mistake, you know, I like the fact that we are very accountable. When we make a mistake, it's on the, uh, you know, it's on the news everywhere. And I think that, that you know, that, that is an important scrutiny. We take it seriously. And when we made mistakes, we work hard to fix it and keep getting better. So, sometimes the toughest question may seem unanswerable, but do you ever agonize over whether a better system could have prevented an incident or prevented Logan Paul? I mean, I think at the end of the day, it has to be, it has to be humans, and you need to have those machines. And um, if we go to something like extremist content, right? We have 400 hours being uploaded every single minute to YouTube. And we are now able to remove 98% of that violent extremism with machines, and half of that within two hours. So you look at that and say, could we achieve that with people al alone? No, you need to have those machines. But where I think we are going, and, and what we've really learned over this course this year, is that we need a lot more experts. Because pe there's a lot of nuances. So we follow every law, um, but a lot of times these, there are, these issues are complicated, they're nuanced. We need to go to the experts and mm -hmm. get their feedback of what content should we be working, should we be taking down, and how do we redraw our policies to be able to do the right but thing. But can you answer the question Ari asked, how do you sure. feel? I mean, because there's a place that Silicon Valley and tech has had in what happened in our elections. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's, there's people been speaking out at Facebook, at Google, what have we made? I mean, all of us, I mean, you know, I think when we look at the elections and stuff, you know, democracy fundamentally depends on, you know, these things working well. And, you know, all of us are obviously, you know, very upset that somebody could have influenced the elections. And any part, you know, we have played, we want to understand it, we want to fix it, we have more elections coming, so we are all working hard at it. Right, I think it's important to understand it's, it's happened, I think, not just on technology platforms, it's happened off platforms and so on. So, you know, this is, this is something we've gone through as a country, and I think we have to figure out how to avoid it in the future. But we feel a huge sense of responsibility, obviously. You know, we spend a lot of time uh, every Monday in our leadership meetings trying to understand what more we can do better. We have many initiatives, and we're working very, very hard at it. Many uh, people in Silicon Valley and in tech say, if there is a huge international election problem offline, of course it's going to happen online. That's not our fault as tech. But many people who are concerned about 2016 and democracy say, if you get this wrong and democracy isn't working in America, then what good is the rest of it? In your view, is there legitimacy to that view? Or is this ultimately not your problem, it's just a government problem? I mean, I think we... we you know, for this past year, with a number of questions coming up around the election, around democracy, around um, news, across so many different areas, like we have, we have looked really, really hard at all these issues, looked really hard at our systems, and tried to understand, as an information company, Google's mission is to organize the world's information. How can we do better? Um, and I think across the company, that has re resulted in a number of changes from 
changes in our policy to um, hiring more people. Um, for example, one thing that we've started to do is on news, whenever we have state-funded news, we're going to label this is where it comes from. This is who's funding the state-funded news. Um, and so I think there are, there are th that's just one small example, but there are many examples of where we have made changes to be able to be responsive and feel that we're giving the right information. But from the political climate, we're going to get to the talk about the Im civic impact, but from the political climate, you're getting the idea that companies like Google, like Facebook, like Amazon, they're now utilities. You're not companies. You, some people think of you as nation states. You have much more power. And it's much more amplified than what's happened any time in history. And the enormous power you have, I mean, you know, I always say the Spider-Man thing for geeks because they understand it, is with great power comes great responsibility. And in sometimes I feel like they just don't understand the responsibility. Part. By the way, Spider-Man actually said that. You know, yes, I, checked, right. I checked through it's Google. Actually, and <laughs> it is Spider-Man. It's actually Voltaire, but let's keep ah, going. Okay. <laughs> I'm not so sure. All right. Uh, someone, if, you, if, there, if there was someone, we had a search company that we could look up these things instantly, <laughs> it would be great. Hopefully someone is looking up. Uh, you know, to your question, look, uh, you're right. Uh, the tech companies have gotten bigger. Uh, I think with, with more power comes more responsibility, and I think the scrutiny is important. I think it's a big part of democratic systems. Uh, you need to hold, hold companies accountable, and I think that's a healthy part of the evolution which needs to happen. But I think there is a part where I think we all need to be careful, and you don't want it to make, you know, you don't want people to reject technology. Technology is a source of progress, and I think how we drive this constructively forward will impact the U.S. and humanity a lot more than we realize. Your company and your parent company have famously said they want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. What does that mean if American democracy requires some facts or objective truth? What does that mean to you? I mean, it, it has always meant a lot to us. You know, as Google, we work hard to bring you the right information. Uh, in fact, we are working to have, there are many areas where people don't agree what the right information is. And, and that's the active debate in society. That's what democracies are about. And it's very noisy, it's a, it's a process where people disagree, it's very vocal, but that's how it works. And you know, we are in the middle of it, but I think we play an important role and we take it seriously and we are constantly trying to do it better. But we are one part of this uh, giant system and I think it's important to remember that. 2018 for you in a, in a sentence or a word. 2018. Um, hopefully bring the world a bit closer together, uh, have more constructive conversations, uh, reduce, uh, you know, drive more activities at the center. And if we can play a part in that, uh, that's important. At YouTube, I think, at YouTube would really like to use video to foster understanding, learning, bringing people together, seeing new points of view, and if we can do that, then you know, I think we'll have a good year. So optimistic? <laughs> I'm optimistic. Pause, pause. Yeah. I'm optimistic. Yeah. I, think, I, th look, I think that 2017 showed us a number of challenges and areas, mm -hmm. um, and areas that we as tech companies need to work on. But we spent a lot of 2017 thinking about how we can do better, and we have laid a lot of foundation to be able to do that. And so I'm optimistic that in 2018, we'll be able to um, continue to, to use our services to help across the board, to bring people together, to provide the right information to people yeah. and I, right services. I think absolutely. There's no better time to be born than today, and I'm very, very optimistic. So. All right, I'm gonna hold you to that, because yeah. if you fail, you're in big trouble. <laughs> We'll be there to talk about it. Okay. I want to join uh, Kara in thanking each of you um, for having a policy discussion and a deep one. Um, we really believe in that. That's part yep. of what this series is Absolutely. about. Uh, and I want to thank everyone here in the Valley for participating in this inaugural Revolution event. You can also find our highlights from this program and learn about our next program in this Revolution series at msnbc.com and at Recode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and good night. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, yep. Thank you.